Today, what I want to go over is this idea of timing charts. I have a video that we're going to start with. There's a lot of explanatory things that I, um, that'll walk you through a timing chart because it is one of those things that's a little bit more complex to understand at the start. But once you see how they work, we're going to do a lot of the what statements, get us some of the uh, the hows of how to create a timing chart before we get into the whys. Um, they're going to be very useful tools for your 2D animations because they basically serve as a way to plot out how you're going to have to keyframe in between and how your actions can get translated with this principle of timing to be um, more accurate, more stylized. Whatever your goal is, this will help you get there. I also have found an online uh, resource that's specifically about timing charts that we won't read because you guys have plenty of time to do that. Um, I mean, we won't read like word for word. I'll go over the basics and how you can access it as a resource. Um, but I know you know how to read. So I will leave that for your own examination. And then that same resource, that same website has a ton of resource, or sorry, I keep saying resource. Um, a ton of information about all of the animation principles, past and future. Uh, so it's going to be one that I think we're going to refer back to here and there as we go. What you need to focus on today, your priorities, are to define what it means to animate on ones, twos, and threes. That'll be easy. We're going to try to draw up a beginning timing chart. Remember, there is an expectation in here that you give things a shot. I expect you guys to when you're starting to learn something to do it wrong, because then that's how you start to do it right. That's by design. So be patient with yourself. And then we're going to animate a shape, whether that's a bouncing ball or a, um, a polygon of some kind, like a, a shape, a triangle, a character shape, what have you. We'll try animating that on a one, a two, and a three. And I'll show you how to do some of that in Krita. Um, and then you'll have an exit task, which I have not yet posted. Our goals for the day are to understand what a timing chart is and how it could be used. Notice how that doesn't say perfect a timing chart and immediately be good at it, okay? We're just getting used to these new things. I'm also interested in experimenting with creating your own timing chart by the end of this week. So you have until Friday to work on a timing chart and then use timing to communicate. Whether that's style, um, detail, whether that's priority, expression, what do you want your uh, audience to be seeing? That's what I have um, up for the start. Okay, so let's begin with this. It's a longer video. It's about 15 minutes. Um, it's going to go over what a timing chart is, what they look like, how they get applied. And then we'll start thinking about how we can do these ourselves. Okay, screen sharing should be up. I would love if, if you would take notes or have a few, maybe one or two questions that you want to know. Um, at the end, but this is also available in your thread. We're going to start here. All right. Give me one sec. All right. So I think what really helps me understand some of these more advanced or more uh, challenging parts of animating beyond just considering all the different pieces that work together is a little bit of vocab, handful of definitions. So you know animating on ones, twos, and threes equals 24 drawings per second. Twos is half that, 12 drawings per second. And then threes equals eight drawings per second. It's important to understand this before we get into timing too crazily or too too specifically, because we want um, our other animators to know what these definitions um, are. Sorry, we need to know what these are in order to effectively communicate with other animators and to make sure we know what sort of style choice is being made here. Okay. Now, if we go specifically into timing chart vocab slash legend, okay, 
You can think of a timing chart like a map. I want to be saying again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I think it takes six times of hearing something in order for it to stick in your memory. With on a timing chart, a typical sort of legend, if you consider it like a map, if you consider it like a uh, a route, a journey through your anime or through your uh, through your actions. All right, we have the frame number that's circled equals a keyframe. All right, the frame number that has a little bit of emphasis on it, kind of like a starburst, like this. That's going to be an extreme. Sorry, I connected my starburst to my F right here. That's an F. It's an extreme. We have a breakdown, which is going to be the frame number followed by a couple of underlines. Breakdowns are going to be where your animation, not breakdown, breakdown, switches directions or switches priorities or does some type of change that's going to better... Um, communicate that to your audience. And then if it doesn't have anything, that's an in-between. Okay. All of these are equally important, but they serve different purposes. Think back to the principle of um, keyframing on the way back and primary actions. All right. So a timing chart, you can draw them horizontally or vertically. So you can go either a vertical one or you can do horizontal. But the most important thing is that you know where you're starting and where you're ending, what happens in between. So if we stick with the example that was in the video, animating on twos, meaning 12 drawings per second. So I'm going to put on twos up here. And we want to draw a cube moving slash scooting. We want to have our keyframes be at the start and the end of our animation. Why 13? Can anybody tell me why I've put 13 instead of a 12? Any thoughts, feelings, opinions? I'm animating on twos, Chris. Hmm? Potentially, if I'm animating on twos and there's 13 or there's 12 drawings per second, what does this help me understand? Go ahead. Exactly. What kind of, <laughs> this is going to sound like a silly question, but once a second has occurred, what comes next? It's another second, all right? We're overlapping. So that when we create motion that crosses more than one second, we have a place to begin our next timing chart, all right? So if we're animating on twos with a 13 second frame, we wanna think about what's our major start and stop points, all right? If I draw a little scene right here, Wish I had. I might use my expo markers for like a onion skinning type thing to show you how to do this. Um, all right. Let's imagine we're in a little field with some flowers. All right. Maybe there's a mountain vista in the back. Okay. The sun, perhaps. Who knows? Let me do a little. Imagine this is a scene. All right. It moves backwards. We want our cube which lives right here, to go from point A to point B over here. So I'll draw like an outline of where the cube is going to end up. We want to think about, going back to vocab, we've got our keyframes laid out, but they're not quite labeled. So I'm going to circle my most important frames, 1 and 13. Next, I need to do my breakdowns. Where do I want my audience to have a little breather? Where do I want my animation to start or stop something? In this case, oh, sorry, that's really loud. In this case, I want it to stop right in the middle of its journey. So my keyframe is going to be about 
or my breakdown is going to be about seven seconds in. Okay. Two underlines to define this as a breakdown. This is the first part in laying out a timing chart is establishing your keyframes and your in-betweens. What's your start? What's your stop? What's your most important thing that happens in between start and stop? All right. Now this is where we can start to draw the arcs. I move from keyframe one to in between seven. And then I move from in between seven to keyframe 13. This first general piece of a timing chart is gonna tell us that there are two major sections of our movement that is going to occur moving our cube from point A to point B. Still with me so far? Any questions thus far? Making sense? Okay, cool. So now we wanna think about, remember, we're using the word iterative. All right, which is defined as relating to iterations. Let me get a let me Google up a, a full definition here. Iterative. Iterative means relating to or involving iteration, especially in mathematical or computational processes. All right. That's a lot of really chunky words. Okay. Another way you can think about iterative is additions or versions. E D I T shins, right? like special edition. We're making iterations, we're making additions, we're making versions. This is version number one with very general information, very general timing plotted out here. I'm gonna use red for version one. Oh, that's not very hard to, it's pretty hard to see. Here, we'll do this one instead. B1 equals red, okay? If we look down here on our scene that we're animating, because this is the timing chart up top for the motion that's happening below in the traditional sense, it's a little bit easier with some digital tools, but we'll focus. If you can do traditional, you can do digital. Um, okay. Version one has a keyframe. There's number one right there. It has an, uh, two keyframes, sorry, a start and stop keyframe at one and at 13, but we're missing in our current drawing the in between. Okay, right in the center of our motion, this is a little bit further than I wanted it to be. This is in between number seven. Okay, that's our general layout of how the animation is gonna happen. Let's say you're animating a fight scene. You're gonna have a character prepare an action to throw a punch or a kick or use some type of ability or weapon, okay? Where do they start that ability? Where does that ability connect in the fight with, this, uh, with the environment or with the antagonist? And what goes on in between? We're gonna start with the basics. Ability begins, ability leaves hand, if it's like a fireball from D&D. &D. Ability connects with enemy, okay? We need to think about the most basic parts to translate that motion, because we're not making drawings move, we're drawing motion. How do you translate that from here to here, okay? So version one, we get just the basics down, like we have here. Version two, which I'm gonna go for green, starts thinking about what goes on in the in-betweens. Since we're animating on twos, Good way to think about this in your timing chart is just to add two or one or three, depending on, excuse me, depending on which style you're animating with. I'm gonna animating on twos. So I'm gonna add a keyframe at, th or not a keyframe, excuse me. I'm gonna add more frames at three and five, and then seven plus three is 10. And then we're gonna leave 10 plus three to get 13, all right? What I'm doing here is I'm putting more action at the start because there's more frames to animate than at the end. And the way that you would add that detail in a timing chart to send to your next animator is with the second set of arcs, all right? So I'm actually gonna use green to align with version two. So from one to three, 
We have another small piece of motion from three to five. We have another small piece of motion. And then from five to seven, we have another small piece of motion. Okay. Three smaller. It's hard to see on the projector, but easier on the zoom or on the screen share. Three small motions between the start and the middle of our second. And then the second half of the second, we go from 10 to 13. All right. This is telling us we count the arcs. We count the connecting pieces here on our bus journey from stop number one to stop number 13. We're going to make one, two, three, four, or sorry, one, two, three, four, five stops. We have three stops currently. Let's add a couple more stops at the beginning. All right. So now we're going to go down and look at our example or our scene that we've drawn here with this cube moving from point A to point B. Let's think about how we can in between this, which is exactly what it sounds like. Oh, you can't really see on this. There we go. I want to go from one to three is a very small mo motion. One, three, five, and seven are all the same size too. So I want to think about how can I move it an equal amount of distance between frame one and frame seven, between my keyframe and my breakdown. Here's my keyframe. Here's my breakdown. I would draw, I'm going to draw small squares so you can see um, what that might look like. I'm going to scoot it just a little bit to the right and then a little bit to the right again and then a little bit to the right again. All right. What that looks like down here is my, from frame one to frame seven, making three stops. One, two, three. And then we apply the same sort of thinking from seven, 10, and 13. We're only gonna make two stops between seven and 13. Now, one, two. I draw arrows for what these cubes look like. Okay. When you break down animation, when you can't see it in the digital space with some of the keyframes, some of the in between, some of the extremes, you have to imagine a little bit. You have to visualize how this could move. Based off the timing chart that I've drawn up here, and the timing or the little example that's created at the bottom here. Does this cube move faster at the beginning, the first half, or the end, the second half of this of this one second? Zod, what do you think? In the beginning, why do you think that? Yeah, there's more things happening, more information that I need to communicate between the keyframe and the in-between. All right? Now, if we were to animate this in a flipbook of some capacity with a little bit more detail, we would have a quick second and then a slower half second. So it would do something like this, bump, 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 right? Like a heartbeat, dun, 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 dun. okay? We go fast and slow, then we go fast and slow, then we go fast and slow, all right? This is a skill that will come with time, and I'm gonna show you uh, in Krita as well, so you have some digital versions of how this could work because it's harder to do these more advanced animation explorations in an app like Flip a Clip, because that just makes flipbooks. But I'm gonna pull up Krita real quick, and I'm gonna do a similar process to this on there. So let me grab a, temp a tablet. Oh, I have one. Perfect. I don't know if I have one. Okay, so in Krita, I'm gonna go to File, New, and then we're just gonna use the animation template, use this template, okay? This might look familiar now. 
This might look like something that might be related to a chiming, a timing chart, not a chiming. Okay, let me make sure my crita works real quick. Okay, it does. Perfect. All right. <clears throat> so let me make my brush a little bit smaller as well. Same process. I'm going to make my... Inside of my scene here, I'm going to draw out a little timing chart. Oh, my goodness. Come on. My screens are all goofed in the way that it might be time for some new tablets in Mr. Blakeney's class, TBH. Why do you keep going to the side? Anyway, we'll draw two keyframes. This is number one. This is number 13. One, three, come on, you can do a three. Oh my goodness, come on, there we go, 13. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my straight line tool real quick and I'm gonna do it a little cheat way and like that. Okay, I'm gonna escape B, go back to my brush. Here's our timing chart. It's not got any, uh, we don't have any data on here yet. Let me see if I can make this a bit larger so we can see. All right, so remembering Krita, some of the things that we need to set up before we get too crazy is we need to add a blank frame and then turn on the light bulb so that we have a keyframe, or not a keyframe, onion skinning. If we add that next one by adding a blank frame, um, and this one turns solid blue, that means we have artwork on it. All right, so my keyframes for my moving cube. Ooh. It's a little bit more of a rectangle. I want my cube to move from point A down to point B. All right. This is really big and chunky, so I'm going to add a new blank frame. And then I'm going to lay out how I want my chart to time out exactly the same way that we did it in the, um, the physical, the traditional sketchbook. I'm going to draw my line here for keyframe number seven, or not keyframe number seven, in between number seven, so that I underline those two things. You could honestly think this like a progress bar. I want my box to be moving from point A to point B, and it stops at point number seven. I can draw, oop, I can try to draw a similarly sized rectangle. Come on, you got it. That's close enough. Okay, at frame seven. I can also add a blank frame and add an end goal of keyframe 13. Something like this. Maybe we're doing a little squashing as it hits the ground, so to speak. I'm going outside my template just a little bit. Um, but our animation currently looks like, oop, it's supposed to just play these. There we go. A little bit um, too much information, a little too fast, okay? This is because I've put these keyframe one, keyframe seven, and keyframe 13 all next to one another, all right? So I'm gonna leave this frame zero. This should be one, two, and three. I'm gonna move these numbers to how they correspond on the timeline. I'm gonna click and drag this frame over to 13. I'm gonna click and drag this frame over to seven, and then I'm gonna leave this at frame one. So now, over the course of one second, you can see where my box is going to start, middle, end. Start, middle, end, okay? Now we can start thinking about in-betweening. By going to frame number two, we still, oh, that's not what I wanted. Hold on, it's frame one. Wait, let me check something real quick. I hope I didn't just break it. No, okay, we're working. All right, frame one, we're gonna go to frame two, add a blank one, and we're gonna think about what sort of things live within this one to seven range. I know that I have to have keyframe three in here and keyframe five, or not keyframes, sorry. These are in-betweens, I wanna be accurate with what I'm saying here. We go back to frame one so we can lay out these, these parts. Frame one goes to frame, oops. 
frame seven, which then goes to frame 13. All right, so inside of my arcs here, I have an arc from one to three, and then an arc from three to five, and then an arc from five to seven, okay? So I'm gonna draw those out right quick. Arc from one to three, an arc from three to five, and an arc from five to seven. These are my three spaces that I'm gonna do inside of my timing chart here to make my box ease in and ease out because it's slow, it moves a little bit, moves quick, and then it moves a little bit. Okay, so let's go to frame four, or frame three, I mean. We're gonna add a blank frame. I'm, gonna, I'm switching between mouse and pen because the pen's a little difficult to use. These can serve as a, a direct spacing um, guide because I want my third box to align with my third part of my timing chart here. Same thing for five. It's kind of five, that's three, four, five. Okay, gonna add a new blank frame at five. Thankfully I still have my timing chart left over from over there. This box has really taken a lot of forms. So I got three, I got five, and then I got seven. Okay, now I need to go back and draw the middle distance between this red square and this green square. Red is the previous onion skin, green is the upcoming onion skin. And then on this blank frame right here, add a new one. Red is where it was, green is where it's going. So I wanna think about, look at this distance right here. You see how this is the middle of this line and this is, this is the middle of the red line and this is the middle of the green line. That's about where I want to connect my two drawings, give or take. Come on, you can do it. Go down. Why is it not? <laughs> These tablets. There's even little points right here that we might be able to use as intersections. Pull down, over, up, and nope, that's too close to the top. We go middle to middle, middle to middle. Okay. And then we're going to in between one more time, just like we did on the last frame. Middle of the most recent red square down to middle of the next green square. Okay. You're just going to have to trust me on this one. Let's take a look at how our animation is looking so far while thinking about a timing chart. Okay. The first half of the second, when we get from our keyframe to our in between, has some distinct stages to it. Now let's work on the second half of this one second by going to referring to our timing chart once again. Since we're animating on twos, and then we go from frame seven down to frame 13. Let me get this. I'm going to should have put the timing chart on another layer. That's what I'm learning. Yeah, I'm going to copy this keyframe. I'm going to add another layer real quick. New layer. Where'd my other layer go? What the heck? I actually don't want to do that. Apparently. Okay. We're on the black layer currently. All right. So we've got frame seven or frame six right here. Frame seven is our next key. Our next uh, one after that is gonna be nine. So we wanna split the difference between seven and nine by adding a blank frame and then drawing our box in between, our in-betweens and our keyframes. All right, go back, add a blank frame, split the difference, make our box way bigger than it should be. My apologies, okay. This is frame 10, 11, and 12. We gotta finish off our animation so that it ends right here at the very last second. Okay, blank frame, smaller adjustments, general to specific, blank frame, just a little bit more movement. Man, this is really, these tablets are not doing what I need them to do right now. I apologize, you guys. And then one last little bit before it 
springs back up to its returned position. All right, let's take a look at this. Using the timing chart, we can create a smooth motion if Mr. Blakeney's tablets were a little bit more friendly with his uh, dual screen setup. But by breaking down the action into your keyframes, your breakdowns, all your in-betweens with something like a timing chart, it's a lot faster to get an animation moving. It's a lot faster to get an animation uh, happening if you first plot it out with a timing chart. This is very, very simple because I want you guys to see how these work with lots of examples. Later this week, we'll try to get into some more advanced ways to use timing charts. I'll have some examples. I'll look around for videos that show the action plus the timing chart so that we can take a look at those. You can see them. I'm a very visual learner, so that's the way I have um, interpreted these animations. But that's a really useful tool that I want us to start using is timing charts. Before I wrap this up, does anybody have any questions that have come up throughout these, uh, these videos, these examples, these demos? What do we got? You can always Canvas message me. You can always ask me later. You've got 10 minutes left. Um, we don't have an actual exit. So that'll be our exit task because the official one I didn't get to finish. All right. This was a lot of information we did today. If you're still feeling lost, that's normal. If you're still feeling not 100% confident, that's also normal. All right. These things come with time. They come with practice. They come with patience is the biggest thing I have to ask of you guys. You can tell where my skills are at. Right. It's okay. You'll get plenty of practice as the year progresses. Okay, exit task, check where your class link is, where you're supposed to be, or where you've been uh, assigned to, perhaps. And um, that will be our last 10 minutes. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it very much.